So when Naomi's husband died and left her with six children, at first she tried to survive by just gathering up sticks that could be sold for firewood. Um, her family would eat maybe once a day porridge or something like it that another neighbor from the village in Duru Beach there in Kenya on the shores of Lake Victoria would bring. And one day, Naomi was just so hungry that she just laid down in the middle of the afternoon and went to sleep. And her friend came by and she woke her up and she said, what are you doing? You know, you've got to get up. And she gave her 500 shillings. And Naomi decided to take that 500 shillings and start her own business selling fish. So she went down to the shore there of the beach and fishing there is completely segregated. The men fish, women are not allowed to get into the boats and then they give, sell the boat, sell the fish to the women and then the women sell it the market. But she could tell that there was another kind of trade going on. There was not enough fish, you know, there'd been overfishing and climate change. And she could see that the men were not selling the fish to all of the women. And so she stood back and then after a while, a young man came up and gave her a bag of fish and she asked her how much and he said there's no charge. And the next day she came back and he gave her a bag of fish and he asked her what time she could meet him. And she said she had some time and she could meet him the next afternoon. And so she began trading sex for the ability to buy fish. It's just how it's done. It's demeaning, it's dangerous, it's a village where the HIV rate is 30 to 40 percent. Men won't wear condoms, of course women have no control of their body and they can't make them. The men go from village to village and it's just a really difficult way to live. Fishing is a dangerous way to live. Um, I remember Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2010 said the number one most dangerous industry in this country is commercial fishing. 42 times more likely to die than in any other occupation. And that was the case, too, in this time of Jesus. Um, you know, we have, again, these really sweet, beautiful images of Jesus walking along the shore, and there's lovely tapestries and paintings and all this. But in reality, um, like the New Testament scholar Casey Hansen calls it, fishing was a matrix, matrix of exploitation. The fishermen, it was kind of like when we went from kind of the family farm to the corporate farm. That's kind of what was going on in the early days, kind of, of the Roman Empire. You know, just to be able to sell fish, you had to have a lease, and then you had to be able to pay taxes. And um, the fish that was caught wasn't eaten by the local people. It was made into fish sauce, and it was preserved and sold, and it went across the empire. Much like today, people who pick our fruits can't eat the fruits, right? People who farm the, can't farm can't afford the food, right? So it was this really difficult system of exploitation. And um, when Jesus called the disciples to drop their nets and follow, no doubt there was some feeling of this kind of aha moment, right? Where in the presence of this one, you know, they had this overwhelming sense that they were loved and treasured and adored and valued. And that feeling was so powerful that they just wanted to follow. I mean, he clearly had this ability to radiate God's love. But let's also be honest. I mean, they didn't have much to lose, right? It was an exploitative, oppressive system. And to drop your nets and to follow wasn't a bad idea. And in that way, we are so very different from those very first followers of Jesus. Because to be totally honest, most of us, you know, we do okay by the system, right? We may abhor it. We may hate the fact that there continues to be a redistribution of wealth from the poorest to the rich. That there's, you know, what 1% of the people in this country owe, what, 80%? And that the wealth you know, is so much more concentrated in white families than black families who've been shut out from everything from the GI Bill to all kinds of housing opportunities. We may abhor that, but if you have any assets at all, you got some investment in the system, right? It makes it pretty hard to just drop it and go. You know, maybe we try to like see that our money's not in, you know, gun manufacturing stock, but it's a difficult thing to do. And so we find ourselves in this situation where we wake up like this on this 50th anniversary of Roe, and we realize that we've lost much of what we value in this country, the protections that we enjoy. And it didn't just happen overnight. It wasn't like President Nixon or President Reagan said, you know what, I got a plan. I got to figure out. I can look at the demographics and see how it's changing. I know if I build a coalition between kind of the racist South, the segregation academies, and the single choice voter who's only going to vote on choice, then I can build a coalition big enough. But everybody knows that's what happened. That's what brought this day together. And so we find ourselves in this moment where much of what we prize about this country, 
the freedom to worship as we want has been taken away from us, or the freedom to live out of our own values that we so prize. I joined a lawsuit this week, along with a dozen other clergy in this state, to sue the state of Missouri to reverse the abortion bans because this lawsuit is deeply, deeply based in the separation of church and state, which is absolutely enshrined in our Constitution. It's absolutely a protection we have, not just freedom of religion, but freedom from religion. Freedom from having someone else take their faith and constri you know, con constrain our own choices by their own values. That is an American original, this idea of separation of church and state. It grew out of the Enlightenment, but this country is the very first place to put it into practice in this American experiment. We were the first place to kind of write into law this freedom of religion and freedom from religion. And who among us knew that the state of Missouri has an even higher wall between church and state than the federal constitution? Our very first constitution in Missouri passed in 1820 had this very firm wall. We've had three other constitutions passed since then, the latest one since 1945, which absolutely is clear that no man should put his religion on another man. And HB 126, the abortion ban that was passed in 2019 that went into law when Dobbs' decision was passed this last June is absolutely clear. The legislators who passed that law, like they didn't even try to hide what they believed. They just went right out there in the bill and said, Almighty God is the creator of all life, right? And then they went on to kind of talk about this certain vision of how life begins, which does not really represent, does not just not really, does not represent what the majority of Americans believe. And so we wake up and we find ourselves living in a world where it feels like a narrow group of Christian fundamentalists who have a faith that is restrictive and punishing and punitive and infantilizing of women has put their faith on us because guess what? They have. Right? And I think about how we got to this moment. My good friend, Misty, she's high up at Alcon, and she talks about how every single organization, every single family, every single church has things they encourage and discourage and tolerate. And, you know, you think about your family. You want your kids to be kind. You want them to use nice words. You want them to, you know, but it's really in the, in the end what you tolerate, why, what you put up with, what you allow, you know, the kind of, kind of snarky, difficult, you know, you have to stop that, right? And we as a country somehow, maybe because there have been so many attacks from so many different angles, maybe because we're worn down, maybe because modern life is difficult, you know, we've, we've kind of like given away kind of what is most sacred in this country, which is this wall between separation of church and state. And it's been a slow erosion. So now we find ourselves standing here where taxpayer dollars are used to fund private vouchers for conservative Christian schools, right? And to think that a high school coach, you know, that the Supreme Court ruled six to three, that he could have prayer in the middle of the football field if that guy was Muslim and he was down there with prayer rugs, you really think so? Anybody here think that the Supreme Court ruled six to three on that? So we find ourselves in this place where we have to ask ourselves, how do we respond? How do we speak up? How do we live now? And the Gospel of Matthew gives us this really beautiful idea, which is that, turns out, we're all in this together. All the Gospel writers kind of tell the story of Jesus' call differently. Last week, Paula did a beautiful job with John's version, come and see and then abide. And then in Luke's, in Luke's version, you know, the disciples, they're out there fishing, and Jesus comes along, and they're like, yeah, he's already healed Peter's mom. He's already fixed the guy with the withered hand. This guy's a teacher. He's a preacher. He's a wonder worker. We are all in. Yeah. But in Matthew's gospel, Jesus hadn't done any of that. He hadn't shown his stuff. He's just like he <laughs> walks in the door right here and says, do you all want to come and follow me? And what do we hear in Matthew's gospel? James with his brother John, Peter with his brother Andrew, James and John with their father. It's all about relationships. It's all about we're going to go forward together because we've got each other and because we're called not like just me, right? We got, a, we got 12 other clergy standing with us, right? Saying, hey, this is what we believe. This is what we value. This is what our, our conscience and our faith calls us to. So a few years ago, maybe 2011 or so, some of the women in Endura Beach were standing around and Dominic, who's a Peace Corps volunteer, walked by. They'd talked to Dominic before, but for some reason on this day, the women just kind of unloaded about their life and how much they hated, how much they hated this practice of jaboya, how much they hated this practice of being entrapped. 
how much they hated this kind of sex for fish. And Dominique said something. He asked a question. He asked a question that was an aha for the women. He said, what could make it different? And no one had ever really just asked them that. And they said, well, if we owned our own boats. Well, no woman's ever owned a boat there. They're not even allowed to put their foot in the boat. But that young Peace Corps volunteer didn't know any better, so he wrote a grant to us, to the United States, to our two taxpayers, yes. And with our taxpayer dollars through an AIDS program to try to bring the HIV rate down, 10 boats were bought. And those 10 boats began to be a wedge for change. The women, now they owned the boats, now guess what they were doing? Hiring the men. The whole Jaboya thing began to fall apart, and they began to build and to pool their money together to kind of start a collective where they could help one another when someone's sick, kind of their own bank, and they started their own cooperative, their own not-for-profit. It has to be the only one in the world with this name. The name is No Sex for Fish. <laughs> there's a lot of harvesters, right? There's a lot of Project Hope and Seeds for Change, but have you ever heard of a not-for-profit called No Sex for Fish? But that's the name of their not-for-profit, No Sex for Fish. And it's led by this woman, my age, my age, Justine, this incredible, proud, beautiful woman, when she was in high school, she was determined to be a doctor. She got pregnant. That all changed. My age, she has nine children. She has nine great grandchildren, nine grandchildren. And she's the solid, strong leader of No Sex for Fish. And when the young men come and kind of want to get in on some action, she says, we are not tolerating that. We are not taking, we are not doing that. No, 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 no. Standing up. There have been a lot of setbacks. The last few articles I've read about No Sex for Fish 2019, by that point they had 30 boats, but the last couple of boats, last rounds of boats hadn't built, built as well, and only 10 of them were in operation, and it was a really low thing. One of the women said, when I lost my boat, I felt low. And then there was the pandemic, and then was it 2022, 2021, they had this massive flood there. This flood, climate change again in action, which we know it hurts the poorest most, destroyed almost every single home in Adura Beach, almost every single boat, almost every single chicken, goat, pig, everything was lost. And Patrick Higdon with World Connect, they said, yeah, they're not coming back from this. And you know what? Coming back from this, you know? Now they've got a couple of boats, now they're rebuilding, now they're finding a way to speak up. And as Justine said, when that man asked us what could be different, that was the seed that changed it within us. When I got a call last year asking if I would consider signing on for this lawsuit, without hesitation, I said yes. I remember that feeling, and Joe, poor thing, he said to hear so much about it. I have been, it's been like the feeling of being called when I was a teenager and I was called into the ministry. Just this overwhelming sense, this is why I'm a pastor, to stand up, to speak out, especially for people who are the most marginalized, especially for the vast majority of women in this country who seek abortion care, who already have children, who are disproportionately poor, who are disproportionately people of color, who may be on military bases, who are in situations where just caring for their bodies is so different. And on Thursday, when I stood in that cathedral in St. Louis, surrounded with rabbis and other clergy, and stood there while we held hands and sang, we shall overcome, I mean, I felt that same sense. This is why Jesus called me to the ministry. May this season of Epiphany have questions for all of us, questions that ask us, as our good friends at Americans United say, how can we hold out what's best of this country, a country where we truly ascribe to live with freedom without favor and equality without exception for all? And may it also be a season where we look deep into our own patterns and practices, the sharp ways we may speak, the ways we may hold back, and to think, what have we tolerated in our own spirit that it's time to let go of and set free? Thankful for this wondrous community, thankful for the gifts of Justine and Naomi, thankful for the gifts of all the people who have gone before us to fight the good fight. We move forward in faith. Amen. Amen.